Hi, my name is Jay Solveria. I'm an independent researcher focusing on the systematics of placental mammals, particularly primates and ungulates. My talk today will review the taxonomy of the extinct stilt-legged horse Equus francisi and highlight a cautionary tale about how someone might rely too heavily on one source of information or the horse clade Equidae is a group of ungulate mammals from the order Perissodactyla, which first appeared in North America at the end of the Paleocene Epoch 56 million years ago, about 10 million years after the extinction of the dinosaurs. The North American fossil record is continuous from the latest Paleocene right up until the Pleistocene-Holocene boundary about 12,000 years ago when horses start disappearing from the whole Western Hemisphere. The closing act of equid evolution in North America has long remained shrouded in mystery because the exact number of horse species that became extinct is fiercely debated. With so many competing paradigms, the task of revising North American equus taxonomy at times feels insurmountable, as it is for this unfortunate paleontologist. The fossil record of horses, as with most other mammals, is largely a dental record, so many of the names erected for Pleistocene North American horses you see here are based on isolated tooth fragments unassociated with complete skulls or skeletons more easily comparable with material from other sites. The holotype of today's subject, Equus francisi, is special in that the teeth are unambiguously associated with an informative skeleton. The specimen was found by a farmer circa February 1913 who was digging in middle Pleistocene gravel near Lizzie, Texas. The remains were collected by Mark Francis and later described by Smithsonian paleontologist Oliver Perry Hay, who sadly didn't have much to say about this animal other than it had upper teeth that were wider than long. Equus francisi was re-described by Ernest Londelius and Margaret Stevens in 1970 who considered it a valid species. They were the first to take note of the species' very long, slender metapodals, which resulted in the nickname of stilt-legged onager parroted by various other authors. But while Londelius and Stevens likened Equus francisi to the modern onagers or Asiatic wild asses based on size, they nonetheless interpreted it as the most derived representative of a new clade of extinct equids endemic to North America which also encompass a giant species called Equus calibatus. Both Francisi and calibatus were described as having long metapodals relative to reduced proximal width, resulted in a stilt-legged appearance. Melissa Winnens, in her 1985 PhD dissertation, confirmed the distinction of the Francisi group in what was then the largest morphometric analysis of North American fossil equus. Long story short, the scores for the Francisi group in both of these scatter plots are those in the top left corner. Setting the stage for future taxonomic revisions of North American equus, Winnens reduced all the paleobiodiversity to just five monotypic species. She synonymized Calibatus with Francisi, assuming that any morphometric differences reflected individual or population level variation. Arthur Harris, however, took issue with the hypothesis of a monotypic stilt-legged equid in North America. Using Winnens' data, he demonstrated that the range of variation within the Francisi group was much greater than in other extant and extinct equids, justifying the case for distinguishing Equus calibatus. Uh, Augusto Azzaroli, in his enormous taxonomic revisions of Pleistocene equus, also recognized Calibatus as separate from Francisi, though he labeled the larger species Semiplicatus. This was based primarily on qualitative characters of the skull. Vera Eisenman and John Howe, as with Richard Holbert Jr. before them, went a few steps further than Azzaroli and split up the smaller members of the Francisi group based on proportional differences. They effectively restricted Equus francisi to the holotype skeleton, which thankfully was not followed by other authors. However, in the mid-2000s, the world of fossil equid taxonomy was forever changed by recovery of mitochondrial DNA sequences, most from Alaska and the western contiguous United States. These studies concluded that there were even fewer species of Equus in North America than Winnens hypothesized, but agreed with her that Equus francisi was monotypic. 
In 2017, a study of more complete mitochondrial and nuclear DNA sequences, as well as some metapodal dimensions, concluded that Equus francisi was less derived than extant Equus, but closer to them than to extinct South American horses like Epidian. It was thus made the type species of a new genus, Harrington hippus. The same study reiterated the expansion of the francisi hypodigum proposed in previous genetic studies. Specimens from Gypsum Cave, Nevada, Natural Trap Cave, Wyoming, San Jacinto Cave in Nuevo Leon, Mexico, and numerous sites in the Yukon and Alaska were all assigned to Harrington hippus francisi. Recently, however, the validity of Harrington hippus as a distinct genus was challenged by Christina Baron Ortiz and her colleagues who recovered francisi as a derived equid close to the modern African plain zebra, though the support for this placement is weaker than originally reported. As if things weren't crazy enough, another small stilt-legged horse, Equus cedralensis, was recently described from the late Pleistocene of central Mexico. However, subsequent studies claim to confirm long-running suspicions that cedralensis was synonymous with francisi, reiterating the current consensus that all North American stilt-legged horses belong to a single species of the genus Harrington hippus, regardless of what they actually look like. The problem with this taxonomic shell game is that if we were to do this kind of rigorous paleontological systematic revision on other kinds of prehistoric animals, we would begin with the principle that the starting point in reconstructing a species range of variation is the designated type specimen, that is the nomenclatural linchpin. So we have to find characters that are unique or atapomorphic to the Lizzie skull and partial skeleton, and then go from there in determining which other equids are really referable to Francisai, what Francisai's closest relatives are, and whether Harrington hippus is in fact distinct from Equus. As part of a larger project to revise the phylogeny of fossil Equus, I reanalyzed major data sets that included the Francisai holotype and similar specimens, first by replicating principal component analyses in R, and also performing maximum parsimony cladistic analyses in TNT 1.5. This was surprisingly difficult and frustrating because there was significant lack of overlap between data sets, both in terms of character sampling and specimen sampling. Curiously, many of the more recently compiled data sets of postcranial measurements had far fewer variables than Winnin's original study in 1985, without any indication of whether characters were removed to avoid effects of allometry, or whether characters were linearly correlated. The end result was that many potential taxonomic signals were coarsened. With that being said, it's safe to hypothesize that the high podigum of Equus francisi encompasses many specimens of small equids from the middle late Pleistocene of the southwestern United States, as far east as the Texan Great Plains, as well as north central Mexico. Londelius and Stevens were correct in stating that Equus francisi is a tapomorphic among equids, and possibly all perissodactyls, in that the metapodals, particularly the metatarsal, are disproportionately long with respect to all other dimensions, especially proximal and mid-shaft breadth. Additionally, the proximal depth of the metatarsals is reduced with respect to the medial condyle depth on the distal end. Although it is difficult to state with certainty whether Cedralensis and Francis are synonymous, they are very similar not just in metapodal proportions but in dental anatomy. They are atapomorphic in having microdont dentition with molarized premolars, such that the occlusal disparity between the premolars and molars is less than in other equids. Furthermore, on the upper teeth, the cusps and conules of each tooth are displaced well away from the center, resulting in wide faucets and valleys. The bulk of the quantitative data supports the distinction of Equus calibatus from Equus francisi. It encompasses many of the very large stilt-legged equids from the late Pliocene to late Pleistocene of North America, 
including many supposed semi-placata specimens. Interestingly, while Calabatus is more extreme than Francis I in reduction of the proximal and distal articular processes of the metacarpal with respect to overall length, its dentition and metatarsal retain many primitive morphometric characters. The stilt-legged equids from which DNA was extracted from, such as the large sample from Natural Trap Cave, Wyoming, aren't easily assignable to either Calabatus or Francisi, or for that matter, Sigillensis. But in many aspects of the skull and skeleton, they do appear to be closely related to Francisi. So it is reasonable to hypothesize that a Harrington hippus clade encompasses equids with some form of extreme elongation of both the metacarpal and metatarsal, and that a subclade of this group has a metatarsal wider proximally than distally. As for the closest relatives of Francisi, well, analyzing women's data suggests an affinity with the African plain zebra, but on the other hand, analyzing Heinzmann et al.'s data suggests an affinity with an extinct horse called Equus ovidovi. To investigate both of these possibilities, we can refer to this provisional cladogram based on a supermatrix generated from Eisenman's data. Here, equus species are sorted into two groups, a gracile clade and a robust clade, with the stilt-legged forms from natural trap cave clustering in the gracile clade, but without any bootstrap or jackknife support. But while there is a lot of work I still need to do, I still want to put out this thought that selected genetic sequences or morphological characters don't tell the whole story. You have to look at all the details. And I also want to emphasize that in this time period where a lot of people think there's only a few extinct species of mammal and all the rest are simply variations of extant taxa, then in fact there's a lot of really exciting paleobiodiversity even in our recent past. Thank you for coming to my talk. Please, please provide any comments that will inspire new discoveries and propel this project forward.